We humans are crafted in a delicate manner, but also are infused with immense vigor. But still, there are moments when we find our heads underwater. Many people crumble under pressure. Some may even break down and fall into the trap of self-pity and loathe, holding on to a narrative that the odds are stacked against them. But there are exceptional individuals who can see the beauty in their darkest moments. They can recall their struggles and pain as something that made them stronger and invincible. Throughout history, we have witnessed certain individuals who are strong-willed, tenacious, and resilient, possessing unshakable grit and confidence. These people are not born this way. They have fallen a lot of times and gotten back on their feet, which cultivated an ability to deal with things in a better way. They choose to remain unaffected and indifferent to the negative opinions and criticisms that are thrown at them by people, rejections, and failures. They have the uncanny life skill to deal with the inevitable circumstances of adversity, extreme challenges, and uncertainties of life. They lead a life on their terms. They have a mastery over their external circumstances because they have a strong internal mindset to master their environments. Let's call them the invincible. This documentary is about dealing with fear, cultivating confidence in yourself, and helping you master your environment so that you too can develop a quality of persistence, of continuing resolutely, despite setbacks and adversities in life. Being invincible and confident is not the absence of fear. Invincibility is about transforming your relationship with fear. Fear is not the enemy. The feeling of fear is just like any other emotion. Fear is actually informing you. Fear is telling you that you need to do something. Either do more research, get some support, get some insight, study a little more, slow down. Fear is actually feeding you. So then ask yourself the question, what do I need to do, think, or go get to dissipate this fear? And then secondly, recognize that fear doesn't mean stop. People think, oh, I'm afraid, let me stop. Okay, that's a choice to stop. Fear doesn't necessarily mean stop. Fear might mean proceed with caution or proceed with more strategy. Fear doesn't, whenever I'm feeling fear, it doesn't tell me, I don't even think now to stop with the fear. I do think to slow down, go get some help, go get some insight, voice my fear so that it's not just all in my head. Recognize that Fear is going to come in when you're playing bigger than you've ever played before. I, I say if your knees aren't knocking and your teeth aren't chattering just a little at least, then you're not playing big enough. The bigger you play, the more you're going to feel your knees knock and you're going to hear your teeth chatter. And I'm always playing big. I'm always feeling my knees knock and I'm always hearing my teeth chatter. But I've created a relationship with that fear. Every culture demonizes fear as a major sign of weakness especially in men. They depict great men of courage as people who are fearless. This gives us a delusional idea that confident people don't experience fear. As kids, we get conditioned into thinking that feeling frightened is silly and stupid. Maybe at some part of your early life, you've been called a crybaby or heard taunts like, boys don't cry or don't be a sissy. These taunts are powerfully reinforced by our pop culture also. We see heroes and superheroes who are fearless in face of the villains. We see these heroes laid back with a straight and confident face even when the villains point a gun at them. Courage is glorified in movies and puts it on such a pedestal which makes one feel that feeling anything less than that is being less of a real-life hero. So, fear is despised as something we should never feel in our lives while it's omnipresent, residing in every living man and in every step he takes. Fear is a powerful tool. It's a powerful fuel that makes us human. We don't succeed despite fear. We succeed in the face of it and by conquering it rather than by avoiding or ignoring it. Invincibility is a strength of character. We develop this through our self-ideals. Your self-ideal is a combination of the qualities and attributes that you admire most in other people, living and dead. It is the sum of all your dominant aspirations, 
It is your vision of what the perfect person should be. It is your vision of your future self. Your self-ideal is what you dream about yourself. It's the dream self who you want to mold and develop into. But self-image is what you think about yourself. It's the sum of your current self. Between your current self and your future self, there is a gap that you tend to fill through your growth journey. To put that in perspective, we are not just human beings, but human becomings. We all tend to pursue our ideal self. There are two people within us. One of them is who we are, which is your self-image, and the other one is who we want to become, which is your self-ideal. To understand self-concepts further, you need to also understand both self-esteem and self-confidence. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Self-confidence is what you do. Invincible people envision an ideal life. They also possess a positive self-image. Their self-esteem and confidence help them move forward and conquer any challenges. Therefore, you become an invincible person when you begin to think, feel, and act like one. To become invincible, you need to be a person with a mission. The purpose in life gives you the directions and your inner compass guides you. But first, to understand invincibility, you need to accept that the real hero in your life is you. It is not the ones you see in that idiot box of yours or in the theaters who are fabricated to perfection. You are the hero, and your life is your story. You script it with your aspirations and dreams, and once you're passionate enough, you take action irrespective of what may come your way. You persist because you need to complete your journey. You have the power, and nothing has more power over you. To become invincible, you need to become the person with a mission. You need to feel a sense of destiny that is calling out for you. When purpose is awakened in your soul, life becomes meaningful and fulfilling. The long-term optimism of invincible people is unshakable, no matter how many speed breakers they hit. They have a deep inner faith, a sense of destiny, and that is very much the foundation of being invincible. Here they know for the fact that no matter what happens, no matter what the obstacles are, they're going to achieve their outcome eventually. Being invincible can help you overcome any kind of adversities, self-doubt, lack of motivation, cynicism, pessimism, criticism or contempt. People who lack this, they feel that there's nothing in their control. They feel like victims of circumstances and they also have a very negative and pessimistic outlook towards their lives. Another nickel you want in your pocket to become invincible is having a great self-image. Self-image is the way you think and perceive yourself. Do you know that you have an image of yourself inside? When you stand in front of a mirror, you see a reflection of the physical you. But that's not the real you. You have a picture of yourself in your mind. Do you know when a person improves their self-image, they change their entire life. Their income changes, their relationship changes, their health changes. And do you know how you do that? Start studying you. Start to find out more about you. There's something phenomenal about you. Do you know when I began to study this material, 57 years ago, I had very poor self-image. I had low self-esteem. I took dumb jobs. I never earned any money. I never had fun. I had poor relationships. And as I started to study, started to study real solid information, everything in my life started to improve. I've got friends all over the world today. I earn millions of dollars. I'm in my 80s and I get as much energy as a person in their 30s. Do you see, when you start to understand really who you are, you're God's highest form of creation. There's things about you that just about blow your mind as you start to study and really understand them. You'll walk a little taller. You'll stand a little straighter. And you know something? You'll enjoy a whole lot more of life. You can have a healthy self-image or an unhealthy self-image. But what is more important for personal development is a realistic representation of you with all your strengths and weaknesses. Self-image acts like an inner reflection or a mirror of what you choose to see within yourself. It is developed by the conversation that you have with yourself when nobody's around, just you and your being. 
what you think about yourself matters and it is influenced by everything that envelops you you know it is said that people are made up of the people they meet and the books they read so in your inner conversations in your inner dialogue you could be talking to yourself like a coach like every time trying to give you the words of encouragement or giving a pat on your back every time you achieve a goal or you can have a conversation like a nagging critic constantly trying to batch on your self-esteem that you're not good enough you 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 mess that up and those kinds of conversation because your self-image matters because you radiate in the outside world what you think about yourself one thing that can be more tangible about self-image is the concept of inner scorecard we all have an inner scorecard and an outer scorecard the inner scorecard is about how we measure ourselves and the outer scorecard is how others measure us warren buffett puts it like this would you rather be the world's greatest lover but have everyone think you're the world's worst lover or would you rather be the world's worst lover but have everyone think you're the world's greatest lover in doing so buffett outlines one of the ideas most vital to leading a good life the difference between an inner scorecard and an outer scorecard which matters more to you how you evaluate yourself or how the outside world evaluates you well in most cases one can say that what others think of you is none of your business and what you think about yourself must be your real concern but what's wrong in having the best of both worlds since the outer world is a direct reflection of what is going on inside us the scorecard begins with our mind if you want others to value you highly you must first begin to value yourself the same way as you radiate what you think the scorecard is about your self expression of who we are on the deep inside you don't live to impress people but to express yourself in all ways possible to deal with a positive inner scorecard you must learn to use your inner critic constructively you must assume 100% responsibility for your thinking and actions psychologists agree that people who have an internal locus of control tend to be less influenced by the opinions of others and work hard to achieve the things they want and often achieve greater success in their workplace now maintaining a positive self image is a deliberate exercise you know it's natural to think about things that are negative it is natural to think about what is missing in life it's very common to whine about things so how do we think positive how do we stay in a state of mind where you get to have positive thoughts one of the best ways to do that is to substitute negative thoughts with positive ones instead of just suppressing negative thoughts suppression doesn't help okay what is suppressed will be expressed in later in ideal ways that's what has been said so the best thing is to think about things that is going great with your life i call it the asset based thinking uh it is look at what is going great with your life at the moment think about things that you can be grateful for make a list of things that you can be grateful for cultivate an attitude of gratitude making a gratitude list every day is a healthy habit to get you focused on your blessings this is not wishful positive thinking this is pure asset based thinking when you feel grateful for something you are automatically focusing on your assets rather than liabilities You begin your day by counting the blessings rather than focusing on what is missing in life. Now many people find that it requires great diligence to cultivate an attitude of appreciation. We are culturally conditioned to focus on what we don't have rather than appreciating what we've already received. Now it's important that you always take the time to appreciate even the smallest blessings. It's important to activate your gratitude by acknowledging the gifts most people take for granted. Now, if you had food in your refrigerator, clothes in your closet, and a roof over your head, you are better off than 75% of the world's population. Almost half the world, over 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. And at least 80% of humanity lives on less than $10 a day. If you eat 3 meals a day, you're far better off than the 1 billion people on the planet who eat once a day at most. So take time to appreciate and celebrate these simple blessings. A daily habit of writing things that you are grateful for shifts your thinking from negative reflection of life to positive reflection. 
it's easier to get triggered by uh, negativity when there is negativity within you you know having a calm and a relaxed mind can help you stay relaxed and composed when people are trying to get onto your nose people with a positive self-image they live their life rationally and objectively unlike the people who suck into the trauma tend to live their life emotionally and subjectively being very subjective to their external environment people who have a great self-image do not take the external negative environment to become their mindset to become their internal environment they are in charge of their internal environment and there is people who feed keep constantly feeding negativity people are constantly feeding drama these people don't pay any attention they are focused they're composed and they're calm and they're also well connected with people who are just like them who just believe in mutual empowerment always remember what you think about yourself is what you bring about your face is the reflection of the conversation that you have with yourself so if you want to be cheerful entertain happy thoughts you are the creator so choose the thoughts that have the power to empower you if self-image is what you think about yourself then self-esteem is how you feel about yourself and our self-esteem is constantly attacked like a weakest player in a game and it is seen very low among the adolescents today this is because we are just like any other fragile beings who are constantly judging, constantly evaluating our progress every day. We feel good and excited and we feel elated when things go according to our way, when we meet our expectations. And we feel extremely bad and disappointed when things don't go our way. Self-esteem is your vibrational and emotional state of being. Your mental state is determined by what you think and how you feel about it. Whether it's about what happened, or what is happening, or what would happen, this state is also determined by your surroundings, with the people you associate with, and the circumstances you live in. We are constantly reacting and responding to our environment. We get stimulated, and we respond to our stimuli through responses. Our environment has a major impact on us. The environment determines how we must feel. But when the environment is not good or supportive, invincible people work on creating better environment for themselves. We are now living in a social environment. Our feelings are entangled in this web of life. Every day we are absorbing information through breaking news and social media. As a response to what is happening around us, whether it is political, economical, or the exploitation of the weak, we often feel anxious, helpless, and angry. So if the evening news makes you anxious, it's better to turn off the television. One of the major killers of the feel-good factor is jealousy. Comparison is a thief of joy. It robs everything you admire about yourself and throws you into a pit of insecurity. It's human nature to feel envious when you encounter successful people. But people who are invincible admire successful people. If they see a rich man with a fancy car, they will tell themselves that soon they will also have a car like that. This is so, as they have wired themselves to scrape out something good in everything, so they take this moment to manifest the car for themselves. You have got to first and fundamentally believe that there is success, happiness, money, riches, possibility for everybody. There's enough for everybody that nobody's in competition with you. And that in fact, when you see somebody that has something that you desire, you should be happy. You wanna know why? You should be happy because it's a sign that it's possible. It's a sign that it's coming to you. It's a sign that you're on your way. If you allow envy to creep in, you have now aligned your life with the belief that there's not enough to go around. You need to stop that right now. See, social creatures, tend to live in comparison and the more we compare ourselves with the others the greater the danger of jealousy see comparison is the thief of joy and here's the thing with envy or being jealous we tend to be envious of people who are just like us people who come from the same background same career same environment 
It's like sportsmen compare themselves with sportsmen, actors with actors, top executives compare themselves with to other top executives from other companies, YouTubers with YouTubers. See, you are not feeling jealous or you're comparing yourself with the Pope or you're not feeling jealous with the lifestyle of the Queen of England. You're always making this comparison with people who are just like you. People who come from the same educational background, same firm, same environment, or people who move around in the same circle, which is also an indication that you're not dreaming that big. The temptation to draw comparisons is all around us. The proliferation of the internet and social media has turned jealousy into a modern-day obsession. We are part of an ongoing social experiment called the social media. Social media is the easiest breeding ground for jealousy. This is a platform where people document the best moments of their lives, or if not the best, they make it their life's mission to make their lives look exciting. But deep inside are as hollow as the people watching them and doubting their own lifestyles. Social media is practically designed to make similar people compare themselves to others. You laugh at the idiots, but envy the ones who got what you don't. Invincible people have a control on how they must feel. Their feeling good factor is not entirely controlled by their outer world, but it's controlled by their inner world. Remember that nobody can make you feel bad without your permission. Even if the people around you try hard to make you feel bad on the inside, look within yourself and check your inner scorecard. Real action follows thinking and feeling, and it's self-confidence that triggers action. You embrace a sense of destiny when you have a strong purpose backed by a strong will and confidence. See, confidence is both a feeling and action. Confidence is a feeling of certainty and assurance. Confidence is also an act of trust and reliance. Self-confidence is a powerful emotion of being in control, a lack of self-doubt, a sense of feeling cool under pressure, and it's also a belief that you feel that you can perform very well and achieve a positive outcome under any circumstances. Self-confidence is also the ability to act despite fears and it transcends the mere feeling part of it. It's important to know that it's an art that can be developed by anybody. According to Dr. Russ Harris, author of the book, The Confidence Gap, there are five reasons why people lack confidence. One, too many expectations. When you have a mind that is never satisfied and always demanding to conquer more quests, but also fearful of making mistakes and become self-critical on not meeting expectations, you suffer from perfectionism and it diminishes your self-confidence. Two, harsh self-judgment. When your inner voice becomes highly critical of you and undermines you into thinking that you are not good enough or talk you out of your plans and dreams, your mind is playing with caution to stop you from doing something. It's natural to feel that way. Even the most talented people feel at times that they are not talented enough. Sometimes you will suffer from an imposter syndrome where your mind manages to convince you that you're not really comp and at any moment now, your facade will come off. When you feel like an imposter, your mind is telling you that you need to work hard on something to stay in the game. These feelings can be shut off with utmost resolve and confidence and belief in self. 3. Preoccupation with fear Fear is a natural human emotion that helps us with proper functioning of sympathetic nervous system that works on our fight or flight mode. Fear in itself does not affect your confidence, but dwelling in fear can paralyze you. The more you feed into these fears, the larger it becomes, like a monster which is set to annihilate everything in your life. 4. Lack of experience. If you've had little or no experience in doing something, you can't expect to feel confident about it. You might be an excellent guitar player, but if you've never had the experience of playing live before a huge audience, then the first few gigs might be busts, and you're highly unlikely to feel confident on stage. 5. Lack of skills. It's not natural to feel confident about doing something unless we are reasonably good at doing it. Having poor skills or no skills can make you withdraw from opportunities when they are presented to you. You can improve your confidence just like any other skill set. Some people believe that just feeling confident can do wonders, and their confidence is built on their belief. For others, it goes beyond the mere belief. Their confidence is based on the ability to do something, 
and it is measured on how they rate their ability to achieve it. Therefore, self-confidence can be improved in two ways. One, you have to work on your belief system by brainwashing yourself into believing that you can do it, even if you can't. This approach might work for some situations, but fails big time when the feelings alone can't amount to success. There is a huge difference between feeling able and being able. Best-selling author Dr. Tomas Chamorro Premusic in his book Confidence asserts that confidence and competence is well-connected. According to him, Barack Obama did not become the first black president in U.S. history because he was confident. Sir Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin, did not establish 400 companies because of his confidence. Madonna did not sell 300 million records because of her self-belief, and Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, and Roger Federer did not achieve total domination in the sports arena because they felt good about themselves. The reason these exceptional achievers have confidence is because they are exceptionally competent. It takes an extraordinary amount of talent and even more hard work to attain such levels of competence. In fact, the only unusual thing about these people's confidence is that it is an accurate reflection of their competence. This sets them apart from the majority of confident people who are just not very competent. You know, psychologists often call it the confidence competence loop. As you become more competent in something, you learn how to do it, you're more confident in doing it. As you learn how to ride a bike and you rode the bike more and more and more, you became more skilled at it, you developed more confidence in your ability to ride the bike. Any area of your life you're gonna go into the for the first time, be okay with being uncertain. Be okay with being uncomfortable. Be okay with not knowing how it's gonna turn out, because it's your first time. But stumble into it anyway, because as you stumble into it, you develop skill, you develop comfort with it, and then suddenly one day you wake up and say, I'm pretty confident doing this. Nothing changed in who you are. What changes is your level of competency, knowledge, skill, and ability. That's what competency is, knowledge, skill, ability, and talent. And so when we finally realize, oh wow, I just need to learn a little bit more here, I'll be more confident. I just need to apply this a little bit more here, I'll be more confident. As you develop skills and abilities in your life, in your unique areas, you become more confident. There is a correlation between competence and confidence. Ironically, people who appear to be highly confident are less competent. There is a reason behind this. Most people are biased to think that they are better than average. Even hypothetically, we tend to show our overconfidence. Psychologists call it as the overconfidence effect. In surveys, 84% of Frenchmen estimate that they are above average lovers. In another survey, 93% of the U.S. students estimated to be above average drivers. Sometimes when I give a presentation on my book, I ask the audience, compared to the average person here, do you see yourself as an above average safe car driver or a below average safe car driver? People raise their hands. The result is always the same. 90% of the people consider themselves above average. Realistically, it should be 50-50, because the average, more precisely the median, is in the middle. This many people in the audience overestimate their driving skills. This is called the overconfidence effect. There's no balancing underconfidence effect. People just tend to systematically overestimate their skills and knowledge, not to underestimate them. You may not be surprised that men are more prone to overconfidence than women. Now, women overestimate their knowledge and skills too, but less strongly than men. Even more troubling, optimists are not the only victims of overconfidence. Even pessimists overrate themselves just less. In fact, entrepreneurial activity would be a lot lower if the overconfidence effect did not exist. And so many of the decisions that people make, especially in starting new businesses, I mean, that is where it's been studied most extensively, uh, people think they will succeed. They open a restaurant because they think they will succeed. But in fact, less than a third of small businesses uh, survive for five years. So clearly, overconfidence is rife. And overconfidence and loss aversion seem to be acting in opposite directions. Bottom line, humans have a tendency to overestimate themselves. Most people overestimate their ability to perform, dismiss negative feedback as inaccurate, and end up doing much worse. If you watch American Idol or any talent show on television, 
you can see countless people who have a distorted view of themselves, and they appear very confident, often lacking the real competence to be there in the first place. High confidence can mask low competence. Also, people who appear to be very confident think that they are competent. When they blindly assume that level of perfection for themselves, they stop working on improving themselves. On the other hand, low confidence helps you see your weaknesses and motivates you to overcome them. It's better to have realistic self-knowledge than distorted self-belief so that you will know what you need to work on to get better. If you lack confidence in your abilities, you'll be motivated to work harder for what you want to achieve, and you'll be more likely to increase your competence as a result. The point is that high confidence can be a curse because it can stop you from improving, says Dr. Tomas Chamorro Primusic. What happens when you're competent but lack confidence? Now, if you study the lives of many professional athletes to accomplished achievers, to millionaire entrepreneurs, you see that they lack confidence. So to gain confidence, they needed to perfect their craft to a level of mastery. They have to really work hard to become competent. And if you study that process, then you will realize that that is how they became exceptional achievers in the first place. One thing that high achievers have in common is that they self-medicate their insecurities with success. Indeed, although we are repeatedly told that exceptional achievers owe their success to their high confidence or self-belief, it is more feasible to attribute it to their insecurity. Why else would anybody work so hard and continue to do so even after accomplishing much more than most people? In that sense, one could argue that the only difference between successful and unsuccessful people is that the former care much more about their insecurities, so they are driven to work hard to overcome them. And the key point is that they work, not on their insecurities, but on achieving big things. The eminent psychologist Albert Bandura, famous for coining the term self-efficacy, which has been the preferred academic word for self-confidence since the 1980s, also postulated that high competence leads to high confidence. So how do you feel about your confidence level? Where do you gain your confidence from? Do you naturally have confidence? Well, many of us get confidence either naturally, because that's kind of who we are, or we build our confidence through different ways. One of those ways to build your confidence for some people is through competence. So when you think about the difference between competence and confidence, competence is really about understanding, right? Understanding a skill, understanding a task and what it takes and, and knowing that you can be maybe an expert or you can master something because you're comfortable with the content, the knowledge or the skill on how to do it. So we think about competence and we think about how do we get better at competence. Sometimes competence is a natural thing, but many times competence is like a skill that we learn. And so when you think about competence, think about something maybe like uh, uh, when you jump into things quickly, you might feel more competent because you know how to do it. When you don't jump in, you probably feel like you don't have the competence. So think back maybe when you were younger and maybe just getting in started into sports and trying a few different things and going, okay, I'm gonna first either you know step back because I really don't know how to play baseball or I really don't know how to play soccer. I don't have the competence in uh, this the actual sport to know what I need to be doing. And you think about how did you respond to that? Did you respond to that by jumping in um, because you're like, hey, I'm willing and ready to learn, which that's more about a confidence, right? That you have confidence in yourself that when you get into something, you can kind of figure it out. Where competence is really, I don't know. And uh, so when you really think, gosh, how do I approach things? What well, probably depends on the content, right? For some of us, that content is comfortable. And when it's comfortable, we build our confidence with that competence together. Talk about this idea of the competence confidence loop. And the fact that confidence so often is based on our competence in a particular skill or familiarity with that situation. The more comfortable we are, of course we're gonna be more confident because we know we can perform. There's less uncertainty. And then that confidence allows us to take action and practice to develop more competence. And of course, when we're starting out, we don't have very much competence, so to speak. And so it makes sense that we would feel less confidence. And so the challenge is then, well, 
how do we actually gain the confidence to be able to start practicing, to build competence? And the answer really is in changing our expectation that things are supposed to be comfortable when we first start out and challenging that belief that I need to get to a place where I'm comfortable and I'm not feeling anxious before I take that first step. The secret to developing true confidence is really understanding that we get to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so back to the idea of that loop, if we can't be confident in our competence, at the very least, we should be able to be confident in our ability to move through fear, to take action despite any discomfort, so that we can start building competence that can reinforce our confidence in that area. And that ability to really be comfortable while being uncomfortable is something I wish was taught way earlier, if at all, even. Because it's a skill that can be applied to any area of life, towards any new skill or unfamiliar situation that we encounter later on. The key is this, being dissatisfied with yourself is the best reason for wanting to improve. Having a little self-doubt can actually help you improve and get better at your craft. But faking confidence without competence can expose your lack of skill someday. So if you're balancing confidence with competence, stay hungry for more competence and skills rather than just looking confident. The bottom line is you gain confidence from competence. But when it comes to performance, whether it is in sport, business, or stage performance, you need confidence. Every great performance has three phases of performance. The pre-performance phase, the performance phase, and the post-performance response phase. In the pre-performance phase, your confidence will emanate from your competency, skills, and previous experience. For example, if you have spoken in front of an audience before, and if you possess great oratory skills, you will set the stage on fire yet again with your words. The performance phase is about giving your best. And to give your best, you need to constantly improve and work on your competencies and skills. Deliberate practice helps you build this kind of confidence. Confidence in the post-performance response phase is the real test of confidence. At this phase, you need the confidence to handle consequences both favorable and unfavorable. You must possess the abilities to handle rejections, failures, and criticism that will be thrown at you without your consent. The real confidence is in dealing with the consequences, whether it's success or failure that comes after each action. In building confidence, we must choose to live our life like a daring adventure to step out of the comfort zone, to grow and explore and face newer challenges. Remember, the only difference between confidence and lack of confidence is action. See, action is the cure for low confidence. In fact, low confidence has a tendency to immobilize us. But when you have confidence, we act, we venture, we plunge as though it is impossible for us to fail. We act despite the fears. Being able is the action part of the confidence. Therefore, it is important to ask questions like, what is that one thing you dream of or would dare to do if you know that you won't fail? Remember, confidence gives us the power to be invincible. From feeling to action, it must become a realistic belief. When you start believing in yourself, it becomes self-confidence. When you start believing in other people, it becomes trust, honor, and respect. When other people start believing in you, you become a true leader. You become a beacon of hope, a symbol of your invincible self. You have been introduced to various self-concepts that can help you build a great invincible personality. There's always a gap between your current self and your future self. Your future self is your ideal self. Some people are clear about their ideal self. So they set plans, they have goals, they have schemes, and they engage every day chasing their ideal self. When Matthew McConaughey won an Oscar for Best Actor in 2014, he gave an acceptance speech about who he looks up to, what he looks forward to, and who he chases, his hero. He said, when I was 15 years old, 
I had a very important person in my life come and ask me, who's your hero? I said, I thought about it, and it's me in 10 years. So I turned 25 10 years later, and that same person comes to me and goes, are you a hero? I said, not even close. She said, why? And I said, my hero is me at 35. You see, every day and every week and every month and every year of my life, my hero is always 10 years away. I'm never going to be my hero. I'm not going to obtain that. And that's fine with me because it keeps me with somebody to keep on chasing. Achieving invincibility is embracing your self-ideal. Whether that self-ideal is 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we are all in this pursuit, we are all in this chase for a better future for ourselves. So here is the key to understand your self-ideal with more clarity you need to understand its differences from your current self. Here is a simple step that you can follow. Step number one is to understand your current self, to know who you are and where you are right now. Step number two is understanding your ideal self, who you want to become and when you want to become that person. The third step is to know the gap between the two. And the fourth step is to bridge that gap by becoming the person that you wanted to be, which is your ideal self, and act like that person right now. See, when you act like the person that you want to become, you end up becoming the person that you always wanted to be. So invincibility is about understanding the vision about yourself, and having the clarity about that person, that the person of the future, the person of your self-ideal, when you behave like that person, when you believe like that person, when you act like that person, when you talk like that person, and when you incorporate all the qualities of that person in your present self, you end up becoming the person that you want to become. You become your self-ideal. That's how personal transformations are done. That's how people change. That's how people become invincible. When you check on your current self, you get clarity on your current mindset, habits, environment, goals, and focus. Your ideal self will require a change in the mindset, habits, environment, goals, and focus. For example, in your current mindset, you have specific thought patterns, beliefs, attitudes, and values that are different from your ideal self. The same goes for habits. There are certain habits and daily rituals that are required to achieve your ideal self. Your environment and living circumstances do change over time, but conscious changes and improvements can be done to reach your ideal self. Similarly, you need to set new goals, plans, and projects to get to where you want to go. The focus Priorities and time management also requires a lot of revisions to fill the gap between your current self and the self-ideal. Identifying the gap and filling the gap is a conscious, deliberate choice of personal change that will give you the desired results over time. This is how personal transformations are done by making conscious changes in your thinking, behaviors, habits, and focus day after day until you become what you want to become. For the vast majority of us, confidence is a choice. It's what we do during the course of our lives. It comes from doing hard things, taking on challenges, risking and failing, going outside our comfort zones. And every time you do something like that, you build a little bit of confidence. The personality has other dimensions as well. It's how you want the world to perceive you as well. You will work on building a better outer scorecard as well. You will look the part. An invincible person radiates confidence when he or she walks into a room. People notice them. They will look the part and will dress the part. You need to command attention, not by making yourself look important, but making your presence felt. Your personal energy and magnetism must radiate around you. You are lively, empathetic, kind, and genuine. You are a source of infectious energy. People love to flock to you, stay around you, and will miss your presence when you're not around. When you speak, others listen. You pay attention to others by respecting others, and your humility will dwarf others around you. You treat others well, and others respect you well. 
One of the biggest signs of being invincible is, uh, you know, being larger than your problems. When you become a uh, bigger than your problems presented, you become the solution. You will not panic or get overwhelmed or act helpless when a problem is presented to you. Rather, you will start analyzing the situation, get to the root of the problem, and you'll find all the resources possible to solve it. You are resilient. You are dependable. People will come to you for solutions because they also know that Nothing in this world can break your spirit. You gain invincibility through self-acceptance. You accept who you are with your strengths and shortcomings. You have a sense of certainty that no matter what the obstacles are, you are going to reach your goals. You will not be bothered by what people say about you because what you think about yourself and your inner scorecard matters the most. You will accept criticism constructively you will analyze it and take the best out of what the world throws at you. You will take each day as an opportunity to discover more about what you can become. When there are disappointments, you will work on better strategies to meet the expected outcome. You will see everything with the eyes of an optimist, and you will work hard every day to make your dreams a reality. You, my friend, have an unshakable spirit that is hidden inside you. Do not let that spirit reduce to mediocrity. Stay motivated to raise the bar. Go for the next milestone in your life. You are a being that is constantly evolving and becoming. Become the person that your heart desires the most. Challenge yourself each day to move away from your current self, to embrace your ideal self. Break your comforts by choosing the path of the most resistance. Have the courage to make bold decisions. Conquer your fears by doing things that you are uncomfortable with. Remember, you are made invincible. You just need to recognize that and let go of everything that stops you from being invincible.